Okay. Chapter 4, verse 13. There you recall from last week that Paul, he turns his attention to the second coming of Christ, and he addresses specifically the concern of some in Thessalonica about the fate of one or more of their fellow Christians who had died. And whatever was motivating their concern, they were now grieving over those Christians who had died, and they were doing so like those, like pagans, like those who have no hope. They were grieving as though they didn't have a hope of blessed resurrection life. And the solution to that grieving is for them to realize the truth of the resurrection and resurrection life. What's in store for Christians who die before the Lord's return, as well as what's in store for those who remain, who are here when the Lord returns. Both groups will be transformed, will be immortalized, one in conjunction with resurrection, the other just being transformed. But both groups will be immortalized and they'll rise together to meet the Lord as he descends from heaven, and then they will accompany him back on the last leg of his journey, just as that ancient civic practice, they'll accompany him back to earth, which will also will be radically transformed into the eternal dwelling of God and his people, this new heaven and new earth. We could have looked at Romans 8, and I had that, but I ran out of time, and I'm going to try to finish today, so I didn't want to go over and look at that now. So it's no wonder that in verse 18, Second part, he says, encourage one another with these words. You see, to me, there's nothing like it. This is the hope of the Christian life. And as I said, Christians never see each other for the last time. Death has been defeated, and that is just a tremendous thing. Now, in 5, 1 to 11, Paul speaks of the timing of the second coming, and that's where I want to pick back up. He says, now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers... You do not have a need for us to write to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. When they're saying peace and security, then sudden destruction comes on them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will by no means escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief, for you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us, let us not sleep as the others, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the hope of salvation for a helmet, because God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. Now, regarding the timing of the second coming, uh, the times and seasons, that's a stock phrase referring to the timing of eschatological events, the end time events. Regarding the timing of the second coming, they didn't need any instruction. See, they already understood that the day of the Lord, the day when Christ returns to judge mankind and to consummate the kingdom he inaugurated, that that comes, he says, as a thief in the night. Now, that image of a thief coming in the night it's, it's, uh, he comes at an unknown time and with negative consequences for the unprepared. That's what's suggested by that image. He comes at an unknown time and with negative consequences for those who are not prepared, those who are not on guard. And Jesus, you know, he used that same imagery of a thief coming in the night when speaking of his return in Matthew 24 42 to 44, Luke 12, 39 and 40. And Paul probably is drawing on that teaching, which is important because Paul's writing this around 50. And so that teaching of the Lord is already known circulating. So that's pretty early, but he's probably drawing on it. Now, Paul confirms and he reinforces their understanding. 
that there's an element of unpredictability regarding the second coming, which suggests that some question has arisen about the matter. But he confirms their understanding about that. Whatever the question may have been, Paul, he disposes of it indirectly by telling them, look, he says to them, you already know the truth that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Whatever signs may precede the Lord's coming, they won't be such as to completely remove the element of unpredictability. There is going to be an element of unpredictability to the Lord's coming, and he tells them that they already know that. Now, as I noted, uh, it's clear. Uh, last week, it's clear from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 3, that Paul later learns of a false teaching that is circulating in Thessalonica that the second coming had already occurred. And he'll address that in 2 Thessalonians. And there he's going to emphasize that certain events must precede the second coming. See, to reassure the church that the second coming had in fact not occurred. So there he, he emphasizes that certain things must precede the second coming. So you see they're prone to confusion about aspects of the Lord's return. And as for the connotation of negative consequences, that's implicit in that image of a thief coming in the night, Paul reassures the Thessalonians that that's relevant only for unbelievers. You see, the negative consequences of the Lord's return, where he gives this image of as a thief coming in the night, that only applies to those who don't believe, who aren't Christians. Unbelievers, they will be oblivious because they don't believe. You, you could tell them, you could try to tell them. You see, they're going to be, the unbelievers are going to be oblivious. They're going to hold to this false sense, be saying peace and security. Everything's fine. Everything goes on as it always has. When destruction comes on them with the same suddenness as labor pains on a pregnant woman, there will be no escape. You see, for those who are not in Christ, the day of the Lord is going to be a terrible day of judgment. And you see that, for example, in Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and you see it in many other places. Those who have not become Christians, who are not part of the body of Christ, when the Lord returns, that's all that's going to, be, that's all that's going to matter. He is the criterion of judgment. You see, are you his or are you not? And so that's going, to be, that's going to be what matters. But the effect of that coming, it's different for Christians. You see, it's different for Christians. Christians are not in darkness. They are not in a state of ignorance about God's work in Christ that the day of the Lord should overtake them as a thief in the sense that it should find them unprepared and vulnerable to harm. They're, they won't be unprepared and vulnerable to harm because they're in Christ. And so it's not going to be like that for them. It's not, rather, Christians, it's, he says that they're sons of light and sons of the day. He says in verses 4 and 5, as Jeffrey Wyma comments, he says, the Christians in Thessalonica may not know precisely when this event will take place, but they are adequately informed and prepared for this day of judgment. And that's how we live as Christians. You see, we don't fear it. We know it's coming, but we know what's in store for us. You see, we know that's the time when all things are going to be set right. And we are going to be united with God in that perfect state, that perfect reality. And he says, as sons of light and sons of the day, Christians, he says, must keep awake and be sober. In other words, we have to remain, we have to remain alert to his promised coming, not lapsing in our preparedness. You see, we have to stay awake, we have to stay tuned in 
to his promise coming. The oblivious states of sleep and drunkenness, right? Those, those are states of obliviousness. You're asleep, you're not aware of what's going on. You're drunk, you're tuned out. That's not how Christians are to be. We are to be awake. We are to be alert. We are to be uh, tuned in and waiting for his promise coming. And those states, those oblivious states of sleep and drunkenness, they occur at night. So they are not fitting states for children of the day, which is what we are, he says in 6 and 7. So as Christians, that's not suitable for us to be in those oblivious states. Well, how are we to be? We are to be alert. We are to be waiting. You see, we are to continue in faithfulness. Now, Christians, Christians are to remain alert and prepared for that day. We are to be dressed in the spiritual armor of faith, love, and hope of salvation, okay, we stay alert and waiting for that because a lack of vigilance may lead to a loss of salvation for those who are destined through Jesus Christ, those who are destined through him. We have to remain faithful till the end of the race. We can't be with Christ for a while and then abandon Jesus. You see, go to sleep and abandon our faith and our commitment in him and then choose to return to the world. You see this in many places. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, fearing that somehow the tempter had tempted you and what, our labor had been in vain. Well, certainly they they embraced Christ, but if they walk away, well, then the labor would have been in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Now I make known to you, brothers, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firm to that word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You see, if you hold firm, you have to remain, you have to stay vigilant, you have to stay alert. You are in a war. The tempter tempted you. You are in a battle for your allegiance, and you have to remain faithful and loyal to the Lord Jesus. Galatians 6, 9, let us not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we shall reap a harvest, what? If we do not give up. If we do not give up. 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8, I fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now, Paul Paul was pressured in many, many ways. Can you imagine the assaults that the demonic realm brought on Paul? And Paul, through it all, at the end of his life, he can say, I've kept the faith. Now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. 2 Peter 2.20, for if after escaping the pollutions of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are overcome by again becoming entangled in these things, the last state has become worse for them than the first. So this is what I think Paul is talking about here in this, in this section here of 5, 1 to 11, that we have to remain, we have to be uh, vigilant so that we not turn away and be pulled away and therefore lose the salvation for which we are destined in Christ. Continue to be faithful. Jesus died on our behalf so that whether we die before he returns or we're alive at that time, you see, either way, whether we are asleep or not, we may live together with him. And he says we need to build up and encourage one another with this fact. And it just seems to me that our perspective is that that's not practical. You don't want to be taught that's pie in the sky stuff. But to me, that's critical. See, to what the Christian faith is. And so I I just feel we need to tell people and, and confirm and reassure and strengthen. When the world tries to pull people away from that conviction, we need to help one another in that and say, no, I know these storms are out there pulling, pulling, but I'm telling you, this is it. You see, this is it. And we need to help one another because that belief and that conviction pours backward into your life. It has tremendous ethical ramifications. How does a person live in light of that conviction is much different than how a person lives without it. 
He says in, in 12 to 13, he says, Now we ask you, brothers, to know the ones who labor among you and who lead you in the Lord and admonish you and to regard them very highly in love because of their work. My screen just went out. Be it, ah, it's back. Be at peace among yourselves. So they asked them to know a certain group of people, those who labor among them, who lead or care for and admonish them. And that group clearly consists of the spiritual leaders of the congregation. And you see, even there, he doesn't call them elders, whether they weren't uh, there, but they were clearly spiritual leaders where Paul has been there for several months, perhaps, and now he's away, but he's, there are people there who are understood to be spiritual leaders and who are helping him. And they care for them by laboring hard. You see, and that's labor which involves instructing them in the things of the Lord. And you see that in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and other places. That is what spiritual leaders are to do. They are to teach and instruct and to build the community of believers. It is about strengthening and maintaining people's faith in a world that is opposed to it. And you have to help one another, and that's what they're doing. And so he says to them, look, to know those people. Now, to know, it simply might mean to be acquainted with them. And that's a possible understanding where he says, I want you to know them. I want you to be acquainted with them. But it more likely it means I want you to respect them, to appreciate them, or I want you to acknowledge them as those who lead in the congregation and those who have that role and perform it. They're to regard these people very highly in love because of the work in which they're engaged. As I say, I, I say many times, if you've never served in a capacity of leading people spiritually, you have no idea of how draining and difficult it is. Especially, I, can't, I can only imagine when you have a group this large. All of the stuff that goes on that you and I don't know about, that is, is you know, it's, it's emotionally and spiritually burdensome. And so, this is, he, people who do that, who are willing to labor that way, to help and to bless brothers and sisters in Christ, he says you need to acknowledge them. You see, you need to, you need to uh, love them highly because of the work in which they're engaged. And it's that, that work, as I say, nurturing, guiding, and protecting the congregation. You know, and sometimes it's, it's easy to lapse into this idea that as spiritual leaders, well, it's about administration and doing, that has, you know, Maybe that's a necessary thing in this culture that some of that has to be done, but that's not the focus of spiritual leadership. Spiritual leadership is about building and strengthening and teaching and helping and modeling and blessing brothers and sisters in the faith. That's what we need to be about. Now, the directive to be at peace among themselves, well, that smells like that there could be some quarreling with the leaders out of a lack of proper appreciation for them. And there are reasons for thinking that that little be at peace among yourselves does go with 13 instead of the next verse. So it smells like there's some kind of tension or perhaps a lack of a proper appreciation for the leaders. And you can imagine that tension between the leaders and the idlers that he's going to mention in the next verse. I can well see that if you're somebody, see, part of your responsibility as a spiritual leader is you have to go and correct people. Well, not everybody likes that. And the leaders would be delighted if they did. If when somebody comes to be corrected, they say, wow, thank you. But I'm telling you, that's just not how it works. And people don't like being corrected. Now, that's not a Christian good spirit. The right spirit is to say, let me think about this, let me absorb this and internalize it, and thank you. But, so you can see here that you have idlers, and I can see tension between them. He says in 14 to 22, And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, comfort the downcast, 
Help the weak and be patient toward all. See to it. You see to it. Church, congregation, see to it that no one repays evil for evil, but always pursue what is good for one another and for everyone. Rejoice always, pray constantly, and give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold firmly to what is good, keep away from every kind of evil. He says in verse 14, he commands him to admonish the idle. Now this adjective that is used here, it can have a general sense. It can have a general sense of being disorderly or unruly or insubordinate. But here it probably carries this more specific nuance of being disorderly with respect to work. It probably has that nuance, meaning being idle or being lazy. And you see it's it's commonly translated that way in the English translations. Paul alluded to that problem in chapter 4, verse 11, when he urged them to work with their hands, you see, and because that's the kind of work they did. He's not saying, look, if you're doing some other kind of work, you can't do that. They were manual labor, so he tells them, work with your hands. You, you shouldn't be idle. So he had already alluded to that, that problem there, and he uses words derived from that same root, from that same, the root of that adjective. He uses it three times in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 to 12, in a context where Christians were unwilling to work. You see, they were unwilling to work, and they were sponging off the church. You had people, for whatever reason, were saying, no, 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 you know, we think uh, we're just going to chill, and we will let other people who work support us, and this gets uh, rebuked uh, quite clearly. So you, you, I think it's, it's, it's right to understand where he says, admonish the idol. Paul urges the brothers to admonish and to warn people to turn them from this wrongful behavior. That is something that we are to do. As I say, we're not simply a social club that sits here and doesn't exist to benefit and sharpen one another and and mature one another in the faith. That's not what a church is. Now, you have people who come and they just want to hang out, and if anybody tries to function properly toward them and help them in their faith, they get offended, and they'll go complain, and I'm not going to go here, and this and that. What do you think a church is? It's not just a social group. But we haven't taught anybody or people don't know that. And so they bop around and say, well, I'm just looking for some place that, you know, I can have fun and enjoy it and this kind of thing. And it's a lot deeper than that. He says in 14, he says, comfort the downcast. Now, perhaps this refers to those who recently lost a loved one. You see, as suggested in chapter 4, verse 13, Wyman notes that the, that the verb comfort it's used by Paul only in 1 Thessalonians 2.12 and here. And he says that it frequently is used to describe the encouragement or consolation given to those who've suffered the death of a loved one or some other tragic event. And this is the context in its only two other occurrences in the New Testament. So you have the two by Paul and you have these two. And so this may be what's going on. He says, you know, so we're to do that, comfort the downcast. So apparently there are people who've lost loved ones, and that was maybe part of what's, what's their fate. But you know, it, it, when tragedy strikes people, and I think we, we do a good job at that. You know, I think that as a body of Christ to come and to console and to strengthen and let people know that we suffer with you. You see, we are part of this, that we as you struggle, you have our heart with you because we care about you. And that helps people. You see, that's something important. He says in 14, help the weak. This probably refers to the spiritually weak. You see, the spiritually weak, those who are struggling under the pressure of being a Christian in a pagan culture. 
It's not easy. And that's the same for us, right? People struggle with all of these things that are coming to them and they're being bombarded with this stuff. And they are spiritually weak and he tells us as Christians we are to help them. You see, we are to help the weak. It's our responsibility and it's our duty to help them in their weakness. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. You would do that, I presume, for your physical brother or sister. If they're struggling with something, they're weak in something that's harmful to them, you would try to help them. And the church has to understand that's how we function so that when people do that, you don't bite their heads off. And you don't make it so everybody's afraid to fulfill their biblical function as Christians. I can't say anything to anybody. What will happen? Not only will they yell at me, they'll go tell the elders I'm doing something to them. You can't be that way. You see, we are to be a community that loves one another and seeks the welfare of one another. We, we try to help one another in our weakness. He says, be patient toward all in their efforts to admonish, in their efforts to comfort, in their efforts to help, and whatever else they may do, they are, we are to be patient with everybody. This is not easy. You see, being patient with people is not easy. I. Howard Marshall in his commentary says, Whoever may be the object of warning or help, the persons giving it must show the kind of patience which puts up with people and their awkwardness and even opposition to the helper. You see, bear with people. This is our calling. So when we go and seek to help people, and they do bite their head off, what do we do? We be patient. And this, as I say, this isn't easy. But what does God, call, does God ever call us to be, you know, something to be easy? Many years ago, I've told you this before, John had told me, he said, look, if, somebody, if, if a human being was going to make up a religion, he wouldn't make this one up. Because this one says, come and die. This one says, you crucify. And you allow the Spirit to change you. And so this is, be patient. Is it easy? No. But that's how we are to be with, toward all people. And see to it, he says in verse 15. I got, yeah, 15. He, he, says, he, he says there, see to it that no one repays evil for evil. The community has a responsibility. He tells them, see to it, you see to it. That no one repays evil for evil. You see, that's how we are to be. We have that responsibility that the members don't act that way. And again, how do you think people are received? Say, no, you shouldn't repay evil for evil. That's not Christian. That's not right. That's what Well, what should be the response to that? You ought to think, am I repaying evil for evil? Is this God speaking to me through the body of Christ? Okay? And so you hear that. And if that hits and resonates, be honest. And then take the rebuke. And you say, you're right. I was repaying evil for evil. I was being acting in a way that the Lord who died for me calls me not to, not to be and not to act that way. So this is something we have this, this responsibility. We are our brother's keeper. And rather than paybacks... Rather than seeking to injure, which is such a worldly attitude, you mess with me, I'm messing with you. You know, somebody brings a knife, you bring a gun. Right? That's the spirit. Well, that's not a Christian spirit. That's not a Christian spirit. You see, rather than seeking to injure, we have to always pursue what is good for the other person, even those people who oppose us. We must always keep before us their welfare. What we are doing in responding to them, even if we respond strongly, what we are doing is seeking their welfare. We are not trying to pay them back to injure them for something that they've done to us. He says rejoice always. Well, that's a frequent injunction. Rejoice always. You see it in Romans 12, 2, 2 Corinthians 6, Philippians 2, 3, 4, 1 Peter 4. This idea, rejoice always. 
And you say, well, how is that? I mean, what kind of a deal is that? <laughs> rejoice always. Have you lived any of life? What do you mean rejoice always? Well, their blessing is so great that it should transcend any circumstance. Whatever circumstance you're in, if you will step back and look and see, well, what is my life and what is in store for me because of what God has done? I'm a child of the King. I have an eternity that has been given to me in a perfect reality because of God's love for me. Okay, well, does that not put a different cast on things? I mean, how was it that Paul could sing in stocks in a prison? How could he? He did. <laughs> you know, he did. I suspect he's telling us how. This is how he did it. You see, this is, this is how he did it. Your blessing is so great. See, joy is, of course, it's a fruit of the Spirit. You see in Galatians 5, 22. And Paul elsewhere, he says, the kingdom of God is a matter of joy in the Holy Spirit in Romans 4, 14, 17. So this idea, it's just that it is such a grand, transcendent thing that we need to keep going back to that perspective wherever we are. And as we go back to that perspective, we find in that a deep-seated joy. Does that mean there aren't any tears? No. You know, there are tears. Paul would weep. But behind it all, over it all, is this understanding of what God has done that transcends any circumstances. He says, pray constantly. It's another common command. And it doesn't mean without interruption that somehow I am to be constantly praying without interruption throughout the day. It's just like a faucet can drip constantly. You see? It does, it, it, what it is, it has to be frequent, persistent, and not ending. And that's how we are to be. We are to be people of prayer. We are to be people who pray regularly, who beseech God, who praise God in prayer. That's characteristic of the body of Christ. And that is how we are to be, and that's what Paul calls them to be. He says in verse 18, give thanks in everything. They're to praise and thank God in whatever situation they find themselves. This is God's will for them in Christ, even in adversity. They and we know that God is working for the good of those that love him, right? I mean, isn't that the famous text? Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Now, can we see how? No, a lot of times you have no idea. You simply trust that as a faithful disciple of Jesus, that God is at work and will bring you through these things and will bless you through them. Now, I grant that's not easy. And some burdens are just brutal. But you hold to this because God has revealed it to us. So they have this. They, they know that God is working for their good, and they have an inheritance, as I said, that transcends this world and its circumstances. So give thanks in everything. You're always able to give thanks to God for his love for you, for what he's done for you, what he will do for you, and for his working through your difficulties. He has not forgotten you. It's not like you haven't dropped into a black hole so that God now does, no, no, you're off his screen and he's letting you just be subject to these, no, that's not true. Now, there are times, like I say, when you will go and you've read Job and other things where, you know, it just gets brutal. Where you're saying, what in the world is going on? How can this possibly be allowed? Right? But you hold to this idea that God loves me. And he has what's best for me in mind. And whenever you start to doubt that, you think back about that cross. Right? That cross that says forever that God is for you. Okay? However it looks, whatever the circumstances may be that cause you to doubt that, you can know as certain as anything 
that God is committed to your welfare, right? You know that, and that's a very basic and important thing. Then he says in 19 to 22, he says, don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold firmly to what is good. Keep away from every kind of evil. Now, the quenching of the spirit against which Paul warns the Thessalonians, it, it's specified in the second clause. Well, what is this quenching of the spirit? They're not to prohibit or to stifle the exercise of the gift of prophecy. You see, rather they are to test all alleged prophecies, to discern whether they actually are prophecies, whether they actually are words from God, and then they are, they are to hold to those that are. They are to hold firmly to the messages that are good, meaning those that are truly divine, and conversely, they are to keep away from or to reject every kind of evil referring most immediately to false prophecies. You see, so that's what he's talking about. Now, the gift of prophecy, you know that was an important part of Christianity in the first century, right? I mean, there were prophets in the first century. That's what they were doing. Now, I don't believe the gift of prophecy continues. I don't think that's the case. But it was the case when Paul's writing to the church in Thessalonica. And given that there were prophets, he's telling them, you are not to quench them. You are not to stifle them and not allow them to deliver the word of God to you. Now, as I say, I don't think that that gift continues. The gifts are given as the Spirit determines, as it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, and he's free to cease giving one or more gifts as it suits his purpose to do so. Okay, so he has that sovereignty. He has that power to give gifts or not to give gifts. And it's evident from a number of texts in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 3, 1, Psalm 74, 9, Lamentations 2, 9, that prophecy is not a constant throughout history. Sometimes the gift is withdrawn. Judaism as a whole considered that prophecy had ceased after the time of Malachi, after around uh, 430 B.C. That's why intertestamental literature, and there's plenty of it, but that's why it's not part of the canon. That's why Jews didn't think that that was part of the canon, didn't have it in the canon. They didn't think it was inspired. And so the Spirit, it seems, does withdraw the gift of prophecy at times, and if the Spirit followed the old covenant pattern, the gift of prophecy would be withdrawn after completion of the New Testament writings and their general acceptance as a distinct body of inspired writings. In other words, their general acceptance as the New Testament canon. And that seems to be what, it, what happened. Historically, there's evidence of church leaders accepting the gift of prophecy into the second century. But by the third century, there seems to have been a general consensus that such gifts had ceased. Now, in his book, Charismatic Gifts in the Early Church, the uh, scholar Ronald Kidd, who is himself a charismatic, he says, generally speaking, and of course there must have been exceptions at specific places and times, the church prior to A.D. 200 was charismatic. However, in the first half of the third century, things change. We still find evidence of Latin-speaking Christians in the West were familiar with the gifts and open to unusual manifestations of God's presence. Nevertheless, we have to admit that even in the West, there were Christians who were raising more than one eyebrow over the gifts. In the Greek East, we hear of only traces, and we see that what people understand the gifts to be has changed. It is clear that the importance granted to the spiritual gifts was passing. This impression is heightened when we realize that a much lower proportion of Christian authors talk about the gifts in this period than before A.D. 200. The gifts just did not occupy the place in the life and thinking of the church that they once had these three centuries saw dramatic changes in the Christian church. In the midst of all this, the gifts of the Spirit vanished. So this, this to me, fits 
I don't believe the Spirit is still giving these gifts. I could talk also about the foundation and the foundational role of apostles and prophets and how that's laid at the beginning, but I'm running out of time. I heard that bell, so I'm going to try to race through. I had marks here on what stuff I had to cut out. Uh, Paul says in, in uh, the end, he says, he doesn't say how the Thessalonians were to test the prophecies, right? He doesn't tell us how they were to discern whether they were genuine, presumably because they already knew how to do so. So he's writing to them, and they already know what's going on. His advice here, it's similar to what he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 29, where it seems likely that it involved another spiritual gift of discernment. Okay, so he says, look, don't, don't quench the spirit. Don't deny the gift of prophecy, but uh, test everything. How do you test it? They apparently knew. Now, in 23 and 24, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will indeed do it. They pray for the Thessalonians' complete sanctification. They are confident of God's return and that he will do what he says. And then 25, 28, brothers, pray also for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord that this letter be read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He solicits the Thessalonians' prayers for them. And as Gary Shogren points out, Paul frequently asked disciples to pray for him. I could give you citations on that. He frequent, now the fact that Paul asked people to pray for him, what does that say about us? I mean, Paul's a beast, right? I mean, Paul is a spiritual giant. And he understood, I need people to pray for me in my life and in my mission and what I'm doing. Well, he understood it was important. And we need people to pray for us. And he commands the saints to greet one another with a holy kiss. And I've said this before. I don't see this as a command to kiss. Okay, let me finish this thought. I heard that bell. I don't see this as a command to kiss. As Moo says, the, Douglas Moo, he says, the kiss was a common form of greeting in the ancient world generally... And in Judaism especially, Paul assumes they will greet by kissing. And what he's saying to them is, I want the assumed greeting to be holy. I don't want it to be duplicitous, as was the kiss that betrayed the Lord. I don't want it to be that way. So whatever cultural form of the greeting, he's not commanding that, it seems to me. He's simply saying the greeting must be holy. And the example I used, if you said, look, if somebody said to troops, I want you to salute President Trump, to give President Trump a respectful salute. Well, he wouldn't be saying to salute, and that goes without saying. What he would be saying is, given the salute that I know you're going to be doing, I want it to be respectful. You see, and that's the idea. I think Paul, because if Paul was commanding kissing, well, then we all better be kissing. And people jump on that and they say, you don't believe the Bible. No, I do believe the Bible when rightly understood. I apply the Bible when rightly understood. And I think that's what's happening here. He says, I want it to be holy, so I, I'm bent on greeting people holy. That's 1 Thessalonians. Next week, Lord willing, we'll start 2 Thessalonians. Thanks for coming.